Hi everyone, a very warm welcome to this webinar from People Management Insight brought to you in partnership with Go One. I'm Jennifer Jackson and I am a contributing editor on People Management. Today we're going to be talking about how to master the art of L&D content curation. We've also got a couple of polls running so please do take part in those and I will announce some of the key findings later. Um, so just to let you know the questions, um, when it comes to content curation, which of the following best describes your function? So you can choose from A, learners have access to content libraries. B, we create pathways or collections of courses and resources. Or C, we use an AI tool to manage curation. And the second question for you all is in our L&D function, which of the following data types is used the most? Completions or test scores and evaluations or dynamic data like search terms and hashtags? or HR and business performance data. So please do take part in our polls and we'll be coming back to those in a bit. So today we've got three expert speakers with me who will be sharing some of their insights on the subject. First, we've got Naomi Hepworth from Go One. Naomi, could you please just briefly introduce yourself and what you do? Yes, of course. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, hello, everybody. So pleased you could join us today. Um, I am Naomi Hepworth. Um, I have been working in a commercial role in learning and development technologies for over 12 years. Uh, so supported many organisations to um, enable them to meet their learning and development strategy through the power of technology. Um, I'm here today representing Goal One. So a little bit about us, if you don't know or haven't heard of Goal One before. Um, so we're a content aggregator. So we work with a whole range of expert content providers to bring together a fantastic library of courses and pieces of content um, and we're able to integrate with learning management systems, LXPs um, and other platforms like Microsoft Teams so learners can access training from wherever they want to um, and uh, yeah, ultimately provide a, a fantastic support and service out to our organisations to create playlists and um, pull together those content pathways uh, to enable them to meet what they need to. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Naomi, and welcome. And we're also joined today by Laurie Niles Hoffman from Niles Nolan. Laurie, could you briefly introduce yourself to us, please? Yes, wonderful. Um, thank you very much for having me and thank you everybody for, for joining. I'm Laurie Niles Hoffman. Um, I'm co-founder or one co-founder of Niles Nolan and we work with uh, CLOs of enterprise organizations around the world on their ed tech transformation strategies. Um, so how basically they can uh, build ecosystems that really help learners stay relevant and how they can help uh, support, help have learning to help support uh, their business functions. Great, thank you, Laurie. And we've also got Paul Neville with us today. Paul, could you tell us a bit about yourself, please? It does help if you unmute, doesn't it? Hello, everyone. I'm Paul, Paul Neville. Um, I'm a positive change provocateur with over 24 years um, experience helping individuals, organisations, sectors and societies um, be the best that they want and can be. So realising full potential. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Well, thank you all for joining us today. So let's start with a bit of a level set. So what do we actually mean when we talk about content curation? Laurie, can I come to you on that, please? Certainly. So content cur uh, curation, I'm going to go with the, uh, I, I noticed Paul said that he over 24 years. I'm just going to go for our 25 years. <laughs> I'll show my age. Um, and why do I say that? I'll go right back to you. It's kind of like the, the 80s mixtape. It's, it's thinking about your friend and saying, you know, what out of this library of, of, of music that I have, do I, do I want to skim for them that's going to be meaningful to them, that's going to be impactful, that's going to elicit emotion and basically make them a better person. So when we talk about curation, it's looking at all the resources and courses that, that we have and saying, what do we need to get somebody from point A to B when it comes to a particular skill? But we're also thinking it's not just the curation of the resources and the and, and the courses, but it's also about the touch points. So it's about when do, will they need coaching when will they need to practice? It's putting those things all together. It's not just consume this, but it's, it's about all of those things around it, so the, the, the practice. So um, really that, that's what curation is in, in a nutshell. It's not something new. I think that's the, that's the myth where people are like, oh, this is, this is a new thing. No, it, it's not. We've been doing this for, for, you know, for eons, but we're now just able to do it in a digital format and at scale. And I think it's also something too that helps ultimately the end user because they're being presented with 
so much information online. So we're really using our expertise to say, um, or the expertise of a subject matter expert to say, what would be the best to help somebody really deep dive into a particular skill? Great, thank you very much, Laurie. And um, does anyone have anything to add to that? Naomi or Paul, did you want to, to add anything to that? Or does that pretty much sum it up? <laughs> Yeah, pretty much sums it up. So that's, I mean, it's a good start talking talking about content curation. And let's have a look at our poll um, to see what you, our audience, are telling us when it comes to content curation, which of the following best describes your function. So 23% learners have access to content libraries. 75% of you say we create pathways or collections of courses and resources. And 3% use an AI tool to manage content curation. What does our panel think of that? So most, the majority create pathways or collections of courses. Um, nearly a quarter have access to content libraries. 3% use an AI, AI tool. Any surprises there? Is this what you expected? Naomi? Yeah. Absolutely. I think it was great to hear, firstly, 75% uh, sort of are already well into um, curating. Uh, like Laurie said, mm. it's, it certainly is nothing new. Uh, we are in a, a very heavy digital world, so there is a whole wealth of uh, resources, courses, um, um, pieces of uh, interesting information out there to be able to pull together. I think the 3% of you know utilising AI tools is probably representative of where people are on their learning uh, technology journey as an organisation. Um, I think the, uh, the absolute dream is uh, to utilise technology to analyse and enable us to be able to create really responsive um, um, playlists, responsive um, uh, journeys. Um, and absolutely, I think uh, that is the direction that we are as, as a learning technology industry are heading more towards. So um, certainly, certainly represents, I think, where we are in relation to market and how people are utilising what they can. Great. Thank you, Naomi. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I suppose I, I think it's great to see that it's about the pathways being curated. Um, my question would be around the democratization of that. Um, and is it created through dialogue and co-creation or is it an offer put out there? Um, so I think that's something to explore. Thanks, Paul. Brilliant. So, um, yeah, good. we've defined curation, I think, quite well now. And we can see, um, you know, you're, in our audience, people seem to be at different levels of maturity, um, which is to be expected. So up until recently, the de facto solution to every learning request was either a digital or classroom course. Um, so with, it, with that in mind, let's have a look at some of the common mistakes people make when it comes to curation. Naomi, I'm going to come to you there first, if that's OK. Yeah, absolutely. I think um... Firstly, I think it's been overwhelmed, probably um, easy to be overwhelmed by the wealth that's out there. The, uh, the world is our content curation oyster and um, it is very easy to get lost down a rabbit hole of, um, you know, un trying to understand like what's actually going to work for us. So I think first it's really hanging on to to like the learning outcome, what are we looking to achieve here with what particular audience in mind? Um, and do we have a the right validation in place, whether that's an internal subject matter expert, whether it is um, about a, a compliance or a legislative tech check or a, a format, a, like the appropriate format and fit. So what are we trying to do here? How are we going to get there? And do we are we curating the right style and accuracy of content? And then how do we version control that? So if we are collecting it from other sources, um, it is only as up to date as it is that day, if if at all. <laughs> and uh, and how do you as an organisation really stay um, true to to ensuring that is as accurate up to date and refreshed as possible? It is a huge mammoth task. So really thinking about that. Um, that strategy behind that, that uh, validation and um, accuracy and version, I think, is one of the, the most common mistakes and not considering that right at the beginning. Great. Thanks, Naomi. Paul, do you have any other experiences of common mis mistakes when it comes? Yeah, to I suppose for me, it's around the time pressure um, piece and assuming that individuals don't have prior knowledge and expertise. And with technology, we've got the opportunity that individuals can self-assess their pre-existing level of expertise. So instead of them having to go through all of the course content, they can actually be signposted to appropriate level of content rather than all of it. And I think that's a, an opportunity often missed 
um, by organisations. Great, thank you, Paul. So from what I'm hearing, creation is a great solution. Lots of things to be mindful of there. Um, it can be easy to build a lot of pathways, but there's just a lot more to think about. Um, so as we said earlier, you know, the, there is a range of maturity levels in the audience when it comes to creation. Can we look at a bit more, um, what would be the best practices you might identify to people? Um, and you mentioned a few there, but maybe we can look a bit deeper into that um, for people who are starting with curation or looking to improve the quality of their curation. Laurie, can I come to you there first? Absolutely. I think what happens is, is, is uh, you know, when we start with curation, people can get really, you know, excited and, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm going to build a pathway for absolutely everything. And I think it's, it's, it's important that, that less is more. Think of that person on the other end. You know, I always like to say that anytime somebody is doing a piece of learning, it's actually a tax on their time and, and their emotions. And so we want to make sure that they are investing in the, in the right possible way. So when I talk about when you decide what you're going to curate against, the first thing you want to do is make sure that whatever you're building a pathway on is it actually aligns with business goals. Um, it's not just something you've decided to do. It's You're looking at it and saying, how will this help the company make money, save money, or mitigate risk? And how is it going to help that person uh, stay relevant within the organization and within their, their own personal goals? So that's the first thing. I think also, too, validating the quality of the content. Um, you know, you, you can go online and you can find all sorts of articles on learning styles, being an auditory learner or a visual learner. And really that, that I'm just using that as one example um, that hopefully resonates with L&D people. You know, all of that is, is just junk science. So make sure that what you're referencing um, is it's actually you know, valid just because it's online. I think we all know it doesn't necessarily mean that, it, that, it, that it's true. Um, so you, let, you know, lean into your subject matter experts and, and ensure that that's actually a, a quality. I think the other thing too is how do you keep that content up to date? Um, you know, it, Naomi had mentioned before, you know, it's, it's only as current or maybe not even when, when, when you post it. So you've got to find ways. I, I like to use the, uh, the Marie Kondo, uh, you know, does it spark joy? Is it, is it still current? Then, you know, if not, then we, we want to get rid of it. So you constantly need to prune. Um, and I think finally too, um, you know, keep it a variety of media for, for, for people to be able to, you know, that it's not so static and also include those exercises, um, around it it's not just content consumption just just passive so those would be some of my ideas lovely thank you laurie naomi what kind of best practices would you advise when people are starting with curation or yeah absolutely quality yeah absolutely so i mean it's, it's a, a question we commonly are having with with our current customers um around like what does their their approach to content curation look like and how can we support that and um, we've particularly been um looking at how we can engage the stakeholder group subject matter experts really early on not only to ensure we've got a real accurate and impactful journey and pathway that we're putting together but also really to get that support and that buy-in and um, all of those uh uh you know l and experts that are on this call will understand and feel the pain of um of the barrier of maybe um management or not having necessarily the stakeholder group line right from the beginning so uh we've been working uh, particularly on one on one um uh, with one organization recently and um, hexagon manufacturing whereby we've looked particularly at what they're looking to achieve through their sales leadership uh programs so we've got all the managers together we've got the any internal um subject matter expertise any internal experts particularly on that sales Sales coaching um, and really engage them in really understanding where those gaps are and then filtering the uh, love, the number of current co uh, content providers that we've got um, as part of our offering really down into a shortlist and then working with them on and how we filter that like what's the right style what's the right approach and what piece needs to sit at what point of that journey so at the end of that exercise what we've got is a, a bespoke pathway we built with the key stakeholders and subject matter experts in mind so that when we go to launch that that shouldn't be a surprise it shouldn't be something that somebody has objections to and they can be a real champion for us and, and for them obviously uh working through with their teams to be able to roll that out uh, across their full management team and really get that um impact that they're looking for so that best practice tip really is about really consider who those key people are and bring them in along the way to get the result that you want to get at the end brilliant thank you naomi um, some great advice there. Um, just to remind our audience, please do keep asking questions. Um, if you have a look below the video, you can um, add your questions and we'll be coming to those at the end uh, in a bit of a Q&A with our panel. 
Um, so let's look at business goals. It can be really tempting, especially when you get a new tool or library to start to curate quickly. But you, as you've all mentioned, business goals are at the center of any decisions when it comes to curation. So could you tell me a bit more about that, Paul, please? Yeah, sure. So we're probably all familiar with learning and development strategy and um, learning and development plans that are aligned to business needs. But I think it's quite interesting to look at it through three different areas, potentially. How we view the learning and development landscape, who are the consumers of the content, of the learner, and also what's our general belief system about the how you're actually putting this into the organization and offering it to your learners. So let's start with the um, looking at the L&D landscape. Two possible lenses here. There's obviously the transactional technical expertise that you're wanting learners to actually gain. But there's also potentially the opportunity around culture change, the transformational elements of learning. So at which level are you actually pitching your L&D strategy? And they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but it's just being clear, which are you actually focusing on in terms of the, the learning and development offer? Um, then looking at the who, um, I'd suggest that there's like potentially more than three. So we've got the individual, we've got the team, we've got the whole organization, but also there's the opportunity of considering those that we serve. So what we did, for example, at the Housing Ombudsman is that we used um, L&D tech to actually reach out and engage with our tenants and landlords and provide them free access to e-learning so they could get better at doing dispute resolution themselves. So don't necessarily just think inwardly, think about how the technology can be used ex externally as well. And then finally, on the belief system side of things, what's your philosophy? Are you trying to fix problems and approach it from a deficit point of view? Or are you actually trying to grow good to great and actually seed things that are working well in parts of the organization elsewhere across the organization? So that comes from the like positive psychology sort of movement. So things around playing to strengths, appreciative inquiry, rather than a deficit model. So you may want to play around with that. And then the final thing that I think about is in the previous discussion point, we were talking about the subject matter experts. One of the things that we need to consider is how we allow the learner to be expert themselves. To what degree are we locking down or opening up the personalization of the learning resources that we're putting together and curating for them? Could they curate them themselves? And um, one thing that I'm reminded of is Classic FM used to do a lovely little slot Whereas if there was a piece of music that you actually loved, um, they'd say, if you love this, you may want to try something else and try that. And again, you know, you've got the opportunity to play around with that in terms of getting people curious around learning other things connected with their, their first start point. Lovely. Thank you, Paul. Laurie, do you have any more insights you can share with us? I, I would completely com concur with, with with everything that that Paul said. I think it's 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 a it's a fine line between ensuring that people remain curious, but also making sure that they're not wasting their time. And I don't mean that you know learning is wasting time just because you're learning something that you're interested in. But I think it's also to you know sometimes you know um, we'll see people go down you know a rabbit hole of, of of learning, and it's great that they're they're interested in it. But is it really going to help them develop? And is it really going to be something that helps them in their career? So it's it's that it's that making sure that there's 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 a a, a push pull um, because you know we want people. I think what I feel is missing sometimes in organizations is almost that concept of of a of a guidance counselor, and I'm not sure if that term resonates overseas, but I, the idea that somebody is, is helping you decide, you know, where you would put your education time in, where would you do, where would you do an apprenticeship or, or a degree that's going to help prepare you for, for, the, for the future. Um, and I think that, that that's where we also too want to keep that, that highlighted because you know, at the end of the day, and I mentioned it before, it's, it's about helping people stay relevant. We don't want them to be made redundant. We don't want them investing time and skills that, that, that aren't going to help them in the future. Great, thank you, Laurie. Naomi, what do you think in terms of business goals and putting it at the centre of any decisions when it comes to curation? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's been some really particular key points shared there. I think um, it is ultimately about consistently coming back to it. You know, business strategy, business uh, goals change frequently. Sometimes organisations do a really big 
investment once a year to sort of set that annual sort of plan. Um, but it's a moving beast. And um, so really ensuring you're consistently coming back to like what is the business needing from this learning and development function to in order to deliver that. And are we are still on the same track or are we working to something that is now six months out of date? So um, I think it is just about keeping a check, keeping asking those questions um, and keeping that golden circle back up into into senior leadership uh, to ensure everybody is working uh, of the um, singing from the same hymn sheet ultimately yeah brilliant thank you Naomi um so it's pretty clear content curation needs to be in lockstep with how the business is evolving um now that's not a new concept but it can be hard to keep that into focus when you're working in a more agile way um using curation rather than building digital or face-to-face -face courses for example now, data was something that came up frequently. So I just want to have a look at our poll results from the audience about how you're using data. And then perhaps we can ask the panel what you think um, and you can talk about your experiences. So the question was, in our L&D function, which of the following data types is used the most? 58% said completions, 18% said test scores and evaluations, 4% said dynamic data like search terms and hashtags and 20% said HR and business performance data. Interesting there. So completion sort of a, a small majority there. Um, only 4% dynamic data. Now let's have a look. Our audience, what do you think? Uh, panel, anyone want to comment on that? Any surprises there? interesting responses would you would, any surprises what you no you, you... Uh, no i'd say probably no su surprises jennifer i think um it well so i mean ultimately data is king in in lots of ways it gives us an indication and a feel uh, for uh, appetite for um for a want and a need um but also it has to be contextualized so if the completion rates are really high on your compliance pieces that's because it's mandatory um, and might not necessarily be an indication of where the real impact needs to be seen from the investment in learning um so i think organizations are sometimes really limited by what platform and system they've got if they're only able to extract completion data like absolutely that's great get a hold of what you can and um, but it's never going to tell that full story and i think being able to really truly understand um, the requirements related particularly to, to job role and impact needed through there but obviously requirements if it in the need as well in the moment of need I think it's really difficult to collect so I'm not particularly shocked by the breakdown of the results in the poll and I do think it is um, an ongoing uh, battle and challenge in relation to that how how can we get an understanding a much better understanding of what's required what's been accessed what is needed and, and ultimately yeah what results we're seeing from the back of that yeah Thank you, Naomi. And um, Laurie, what do you think in terms of how data can contribute to a curation strategy and how L&D practitioners should use it? Oh, absolutely. I concur with everything that, that Naomi said. I mean, the one thing is it, it, we are still in the infancy of what data we actually can collect and, and track. And you know, certainly some things are much harder than others. We're good at completions and test scores, evaluations, and that because we've always done that. We have mechanisms to do that. But what I always talk about, you know, when I talk about data with our with our clients is look for simply what's available. It's better than than nothing. Talk to IT. You'll often find that they're tracking a lot of things that, that they don't even know why they're tracking. Um, they'll be looking at things like search terms. They'll be looking at things whether um, how many mobile devices are out there. A really big one is how many devices have accessibility software on them, which is really key, especially when you're curating to make sure that everybody's able to 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 access it. Um, so you want to look at some of those those things so it's just going to give you a bigger a bigger picture I think the other thing too is to look at you know what people are actually consuming you know when you have a number of pathways which ones are most popular what and and try and decode you know why uh, likes comments shares any of those sorts of things if you're able to get those that that, that mechanism on your learning platform um, are, are, are very critical I also recommend too if you want a different slant on on, on how to use data um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, 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 in really having some divergent thinking in that 
You look to other industries. Take a look at, if you go to HubSpot, for example, they have a whole uh, bunch of learning on how to be a community manager. That's not a role that we typically see in L&D, but it's one that we should have. Um, and even though they're talking about it from a marketing standpoint, a lot of that translates into how you use data and engagement and understanding communities uh, when it comes to curation. Um, and those are those are free resources you can just register and have a look at. And again, it's for marketing, but if you put an L and D lens on on top of it, I think you'll be quite quite inspired as to how they use uh, a data and how they leverage it. I think the other thing too, just to, when it comes to data, is also to you know causation, but not correlation. I like to do you know a, a joke that you know the average uh, lifespan in Canada is eighty four years, and we love maple syrup, therefore maple syrup living you know past eighty five. Definitely not true. Um, but uh, so you need to be careful when working with data. But I also say too. We've been operating without data for a very, very long time. So, you know, a little bit of data is at least uh, helps us to just, you know, just focus our efforts. Thank you, Laurie. Paul, did you have anything to add to that? Any reactions, any tips from you? Yeah, I, I think um, I agree with everything I've heard so far. The, the things that I would add in is, again, we've got the use of technology. So some of the actual um, impact isn't collected in the actual content curation space. It's actually collected in the performance review space. So actually, how do you actually get a um, sense of your talent management um, looking at where has the learning led to an actual material change in either performance or behaviours, you know, so that's something to think about, you know, how can that be connected? Um, I do think there is something around also having a, a bit of a, a re real reflection around understanding and insight around what, what truly is the expertise of data and analytics. So, for example, you know, are we chasing leading or lagging indicators? Are we looking at outcomes or outputs? Um, those sort of things are quite important to think about. And one of the things I think is really, really important, particularly if you're starting on this journey, is how are you going to establish your baseline? You can only demonstrate improvement and value for money uh, if you've actually established a baseline. So having that conversation mm -hmm. around the data and analytics space early is better than late. Great tips there. Thank you for that advice as well, Paul. Um, now, just seeing some questions come through from our audience. Thank you for sending in your questions. Um, one of them we've got here. So how is it best to deal with copyright issues when curating content? Naomi, do you think you could answer that one? Or who would like to answer that one? Yeah, sure. Certainly um, a, a challenge um, in, in, amongst, um, in amongst this particular world. Um, so ultimately, I think uh, if, if there's something is copyrighted, like we do need to try and ask for permission, if you can, <laughs> uh, because uh, you know, ultimately that is owned, there's copyright laws in place. Um, and if you are in a position whereby you're... Um, you know, utilising or, or advertising or whatever that might be, that, that sort of piece of content, and you are asked to sort of remove it, then obviously you need to, you do need to abide by those laws. So just get comfortable with the laws, make sure you're asking where you need to. And um, But there is a lot of uh, content out there. So very rarely is that the, you know, if you come across a really fantastic resource, it's copyrighted, um, there is almost always a repetition of that a lot of what we're curating isn't unique and um, so you know carry on search and see what you can find uh, that is uh, that you are able to to utilize and are able to uh, comfortably and safely go ahead and, and sort of maximize so there's certainly a couple of thoughts from me but um open up to the rest of the panel who've got any additional tips on this complicated uh, complicated <laughs> element I reflect on my um, grand, bless her, who's no longer here. She used to paint and she used to work on the basis of if she was taking a master and doing a master, she was just taking out some of the art to be able to actually um, recycle and use it in its you know, non-original form. So I'm no copyright expert, so I don't know if that's legit or not, but um, actually adapting what you've got rather than using it verbatim is something to consider. And obviously, um, you know, signpost your sources. Be very honest about your sources is what I would say. I would agree with everything. And I think a lot of the 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 
what we understand as copyright has certainly changed, especially with the proliferation of Instagram and TikTok and user generated content. They want you to consume that, right? Now, I'm not saying everything on TikTok and Instagram is good quality, but I'm just saying, I don't know, but on YouTube, it's people that the goal is for them to consume. I remember going back in the day, I'm really showing my age, when we couldn't even link to YouTube content because that was considered copyright. Um, and times have certainly changed where the, you know, the, the, the model is that it, it is it is for the views and like so long as it is, it is quality. Um, so I think it's being it's being res respectful of, of, of that. Learning paths that include YouTube videos and podcasts, not just e-lessons. So um, do you want to sort of talk a bit more about that, a bit, a bit more in terms of what you think about that? Well, I think absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think that this is this is um, really, really, really quite quite in, important, um, and I think it's 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 quite it's quite critical. That's that's where we're getting actually a lot of fantastic content is coming from from these sources. These are subject matter experts that um, you know, are passionate about what they do and have real immediate responses um, and uh, to 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 uh, to topics. So I think it's 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 quite quite critical to do that. Now, there's a lot of junk on there, so you do need to be careful. Um, but you know th those are the places where you know you're, you're really going to, be going to get you know some 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 great great things. Great, thank you, Laurie. Um, I've just been told that we had an audio drop when I asked that question, so I will repeat the question. Hopefully, it comes through. What are your thoughts on curating learning paths that include YouTube videos and podcasts, not just e-lessons? So hopefully, um, you then got the answer. Mm -hmm. That that was the question. One quick thing I'd add to that, though, is also make sure to that YouTube and, and if you are using any other of, of those platforms are actually accessible in all the regions that you're operating in, um, because in some places it'll be locked or also to maybe IT will will have, have blocked some of those those things. So that's just a technical restriction. Lovely. Thanks, Laurie. Does anyone, Paul, did you have something to add to that there? Yeah, I think um, you can be very creative with some of the content that's out there. Um, so, you know, I'm mindful of like some very inspirational and amazing TED Talks that mm -hmm. I embed into learning events in, in organisations because they're inspirational and they're, they're powerful. Mm -hmm. So why create content yourself when it's, there's some stuff available? Mm -hmm. The other thing to bear in mind is like that you've got your professional institutions, charities, not-for-profits. Those actually put together an awful lot of resource that could potentially be used. So, you know, be creative in terms of where you're seeking the resource from. Um, don't just assume it's the usual suspects. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, just having a look at some more audience questions here. Um, so does the panel have any best practice about how to engage or move the organisation from a paid course or e-learning as a solution for all to a place where they are receptive to concept of and use, use curated resources? Any thoughts there from anyone who would like to, to have a go at that moving from paid courses i suppose i would take it up a level and want to understand what's the philosophy uh, and principles around learning and development um, so for example does the culture support personal development does it understand that learning and development is a key part of successful business and enterprise um, and and it's in that domain you start to unpackage how do you then sell and influence to move the thinking over from one form of delivery to another. So what I'm trying to do is taking it away from the delivery method to understanding what is actually the outcomes that you're seeking to achieve um, in terms of the learning and development approach, but also what's your philosophy is that actually is probably framing either positively or negatively what you think the value of learning and development is to an organization. Great, thank you, Paul. And um, we've had a comment, um, it's a bit more of a statement than a, than a question, but you might want to, to comment on it. Um, so regarding content curation, some great tips and advice. Um, thank you very much. So personally, I also think sector or industry rele relevance is vital. Learn the lingo and the clients and build that in to the content. Any kind of reactions to that? Any comments? 
I yeah. think that's, go on, sorry, Naomi, go for it. I think I think the word relevance is, is particularly key in that sentence. So um, this is absolutely about like, who, like, how are we, how are we going to be in a, a position of confidence that this is going to be positively reacted to? How is it going to do the job that it needs to do? And what level of relevance is vital? Um, so this absolutely is about understanding your personas internally. Um, and how that links and for those uh, organizations that whereby like in their industry or the industry that they're working in or ultimately ultimately the industry that you're serving is is really crucial to the the role that you're looking to um engage and develop and um, then absolutely understanding how you can access curated content filtered by industry is really really crucial and i think um being able to, to either do that self-serve or work with organisations like ourselves who can support that filtering and provide that list of, of really clear um, and a uh, clear and um, filtered and relevant content is, is really crucial uh, to being able to feel sure that you're going to really nail what you need to nail and, and hit that hit that individual with the right with the right piece of content. I, I entirely agree with Naomi. I, I'd add in that I mean, I'm going to be a bit of um, a divergent thinker on this. I think whilst needing to manage the expectations of your audience, there is actually sometimes value in terms of bringing in other sectors and other subject matter experiences um, to actually help the organization move beyond where it is currently. Particularly if we think in the space of creativity and innovation, often it's the fusion of ideas from different sectors and different subject areas that actually leads to advancements or improvements that hadn't been thought of before. So whilst I entirely concur with the audience member in terms of like, actually, you don't want to alienate people, you do want to be able to know your um, sector and your industry and, and talk relevantly to them, um, there is opportunity, depending on need, um, to bring in um, out of sector experience and expertise. Great. Thank you, Paul. Any final thoughts from you, Laurie, before we move on? Um, no, not from me. I, 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 I think Naomi and Paul handled that. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, I think it would be really nice to round up, perhaps, um, with some key takeaways from each of our panellists, just in terms of what people can take away with them and implement as those first steps to content curation for learning and development. Where, where do people start in a nutshell? Um, I'll come to you first, Naomi. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the real key sort of standout uh, takeaways, um, certainly that I've I've sort of picked up on in these conversations, and, and think are really crucial, is absolutely about really understanding what you're trying to achieve. Like, where where are we going with this? What is that particular goal, and what does that mean for my uh, my audience? What does it mean for how we engage? What does it mean for ensuring where we've got the accuracy and the in the validation of the, of the piece and internally support uh, pu pulling together the team that needs to and working with external organisations where needed to really nail that. So, like goal setting, how that links to business, and what's the plan to be able to get there, and we keep going back to it, keep evolving it, um, would be my sort of really key takeaways from today. Great, thank you, Naomi. Paul. Yeah, I think there's two. Um, unsurprisingly, um, I'd say strategic mindedness, um, picking up on Miami's point, you know, what are the ultimate business goals and outcomes that you're seeking, not just the operational focus and the operational execution um, is the first point. And the second one is around dialogue, not just dialogue with leaders and managers and those that own the L&D agenda, but dialogue with the consumers of the curated content. Um, so understanding the learner well and understanding their needs rather than just doing, for example, a flat learning and development, sorry, a flat learning needs analysis. Yeah. Um, so actually, how do you create dialogue through understanding um, your learner? Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Laurie? Um, all the points that have been, been made were, were absolutely fantastic and I don't want to repeat any of them. So I'll add what I think is maybe something, something different to also think about is when you're curating pathways, like I see a lot of our clients, they want to have all the pathways done when they launch. Um, and I think that you need to, that's actually the, the, not what you want to be doing. I mean, it's nice to have, but on the other hand, you need to have incentive and something new for people as they come in. So it's best to start small. And then so that every time people um, access the platform, there is something new for them to engagement, or is there something new that, you know, you're, you're, you're promoting um, because otherwise it becomes very stagnant. Um, and so you need to think of that content strategies. What's to launch on not just day one, day two, day 71, 
day 305. What are they going to be able to see and have, have that? Um, you may also too, when it comes to content curation, again, this is another tip out of community managers, is you know what things are you going to dial up the, um, the volume on? What things are you going to tune down? And that's going to be you know dynamic depending on the needs of the organization and as, as things evolve. So you may have you know, cybersecurity is a skill that we know globally is in, is in demand. So that may be something that you know week seven after launch, you're going to do a promotion on some of that content with really good pathways curated against that. And then you're going to, you know, to Paul's point, you're going to look at what is the impact of that? You know, how are we able then to, to, to say, you know, people have actually learned this skill and we've now created, um, you know, we've closed some, some gaps there. Um, so really thinking about it from, from, from that, that perspective, rather than how many pathways can I build at once? Because everybody wants it. Brilliant. Thank you, Laurie. Um, we've just had a few last minute questions come through. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes to just look at those if that's okay. Um, so do you feel content is even more important now with increased home working and potentially less opportunities for informal learning? Naomi, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, I, I think the, sh the shift to hi hybrid or hybrid or more remote working has um, in some ways uh, fast tracked our digital uh, digital journey for, for learning and development um, and at one point was the only ability for us to engage with individuals um, but I think it's about looking at um, blended at the right points um, so rather than it being all one or another it's uh, which particular format is going to provide the best best particular output at what particular point um, and how you um, overlay that content piece with uh, facilitated sessions and with a uh, face-to-face -face when it becomes really impactful. Um, so I know that that is uh, uh, the blended concept and the and the, uh, the theory that sits behind that has, has been in place for a lot lot longer than, than, than COVID and the impact of COVID has. But I think it's more crucial at this particular point to really recognize it it would be quite easy just to jump pure digital because of the amount of people that are at home now but when you are get in a position where you are able to get people together like what are you looking to achieve at that particular point and what's going to have the most impact from having that face-to-face -to -face time together um but making sure that we are still pocketing the blended approach throughout like for example your webinar breakout rooms using the technology that you've got to be able to um really en uh, enable that knowledge transfer into a behavior shift which is difficult to do through just pure content delivery um so yeah there will be some of my immediate thoughts on that one thank you naomi um we'll just squeeze in the final question um from the audience how do you develop programs to support not only succession but cross-boarding of individuals so how do you develop programs to support not only succession but cross-boarding of individuals Laurie? I think for me, um, it, it, the big thing on that, I mean, in the short amount of time that we have, I won't give a, a, a wholesome answer, but um, I think I think the um, that's where you really want to rely on the uh, user-generated content and where you really want to rely on what, what expertise people actually have, particularly when it comes to cross-boarding. Um, you know, you really, they know this, this job and they know what people need to succeed. So draw on that, have them create pathways, have them, you know, contribute to, to those things because otherwise you're just going to be, you know, chasing your tail basically as an LD function trying to unpick what that knowledge actually is. Lovely. Thank you, Laurie. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Um, I really hope you found the discussion useful um, and thank you to our panellists. You've been fantastic. The recording will be available on demand once we finish the session. So that just leaves me to, to say many thanks again to our speakers, Naomi, Laurie and Paul for taking part and to everyone who's joined us today. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, GoOne, for partnering with us on the webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone.